altered, making them completely secure. So what are the advantages of blockchain? Well, there's a good few. First of all, it's a decentralized public ledger, which means there is no need for a centralized third party to confirm transactions and there's also no centralized vulnerabilities. You cannot hack it because it cannot be changed once it's closed off. It is also a peer-to-peer -peer network when it comes to transactions. So if I want to send you a transaction, it's between me and you. We don't have to go through a third party to verify or confirm that transaction. Okay? There is no need for centralized confirmation in that case. Now, the data stored in the blockchain is incorruptible. It cannot be hacked. Now, that does not mean you cannot be hacked and you can't lose your money, but the data stored on the blockchain cannot be hacked. So if you can safely store your cryptocurrency, no one can hack the blockchain and change the ownership. Now, the ownership of the currency or the token is transferred on the blockchain. So your Bitcoin or your Ethereum or your Litecoin never actually leaves the blockchain. But what you do is you're transferring ownership of the amount of that cryptocurrency, that blockchain, to someone else. Okay? And don't worry, I will explain this in more detail as we're talking about digital currencies and open source platforms. But essentially, essentially, you never actually have the Bitcoin. What you have is the password to the Bitcoin. Now, the potential of blockchain technology is, of course, not just in digital currencies. The long-term potential could change the way business works, the way supply chains work, the way financial transactions work, the way asset ledgers and secure decentralized networks work. Essentially, businesses could use smart contracts. It has the potential to spurn multiple worldwide payment systems, which can complete transactions in seconds. And it very much has the tech. It very much has the potential to completely change the way we do business, the way the financial sector works, and the way we use money if it is implemented long term. Now, it's not actually being adopted and implemented on a large scale yet, but it is being tested by Fortune 500 companies to where they can actually use it. Okay? Now, that's just a quick overview of what blockchain is. And if you didn't quite understand that, don't worry, because I think when we talk about Bitcoin, it's going to make more sense. So speaking of Bitcoin, what is Bitcoin? Okay, Bitcoin has been talked about hugely over the past year, but it has been in and out of the news since 2008, 2009, when it officially created the first block and became a digital currency. Well, Bitcoin is essentially the first decentralized digital currency or cryptocurrency, and it is a worldwide payment system that works without the need of a central bank or centralized administrator. So the advantage here is we don't actually need a centralized authority to confirm transactions. So we don't need a bank. We can be in complete control of our digital asset and where we send that digital asset without the need for a third party to verify that transaction. Okay? Now, how exactly does that work? Well, it was the first digital currency. So it came out of 2008, it came out of the financial crash, and it came out of the loss of confidence in standard financial institutions and banks. And that is why it's specifically designed to not have a third party controlling and verifying transactions. It is to give you complete control of your digital currency, where it goes and who it goes to without the vulnerabilities of a centralized exchange or bank losing your money or being hacked. Okay? Now, it is completely decentralized, which means everyone can see every transaction on the blockchain. We do not need a centralized authority. Okay? It is a peer-to-peer -peer worldwide network. If I'm in Ireland and you're in Tokyo, I can send you money pretty much immediately or Bitcoin pretty much immediately in Tokyo from Ireland over the internet in a matter of minutes. 
The transactions are recorded on the public ledger on the blockchain. So we know that once that block closes off, it's secure. You have the money I sent you and I am now deducted or minus the amount I had in my wallet. Okay. Now the inventor, which this is a quite interesting one. The inventor is a guy called Satoshi Nakamoto. However, we don't actually know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. We don't know if it's one person. We don't know if it's a group of programmers. And really, it looks like it's a hidden source identity to cover who the real person or real people were. Now, it does look like it came out of another cryptography project a couple of years earlier, which was a bunch of programmers, which then became the Bitcoin developers, but no one has ever really confirmed who Satoshi Nakamoto is, whether it be one person or whether it be a group of people. Unlike most other digital currencies now that we know who actually invented or created the first blockchain. Okay, now let's talk about the blockchain in terms of digital currency. All the blockchain is, it is a public ledger. It is a public list of all Bitcoin transactions that are recorded for all to see. Now, they don't see your name, they don't see your date of birth, but what they see is your Bitcoin address, okay? Now, this technology allows trusted peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the need for a central authority. So, as I said, I'm in Ireland and I can, I can send you Bitcoin in Tokyo knowing that through the blockchain, it is completely secure and we do not need a centralized authority to verify or confirm the transaction because the blockchain does it all for us. And that's the great thing about it. Okay, now, I'll give you an example. Okay, I am in Ireland and I decide to send you a hundred dollars in, okay, let's say you're in Texas in the USA. So I'm in Dublin, Ireland, and I want to send you $100 in Texas. Now, I can't send you $100, so I send you the Bitcoin equivalent, and $100 is currently 0 0.018 Bitcoin. So to do, to do this, all I need to do is go to my secure Bitcoin wallet, open it up, and much like a bank account number, I need your public key, your wallet address. I simply type this into my wallet. I confirm the transaction by making sure that I have the correct address, the correct amount. Once I'm happy with it, I hit send, and this is recorded in the blockchain within 10 minutes. Now, within 10 minutes, I will now be deducted 0.018 Bitcoin, and you'll be credited 0.018 Bitcoin, which is equal to $100. So I have sent you $100 from Dublin to Texas within 10 minutes. Okay, now that is just not possible through a bank. To do this same transaction through a bank, it would take five to seven working days through electronic fund transfer. Okay, now you can do something similar with maybe if we talk about PayPal or Stripe, but the difference with them is they need a bank account, they need a credit card, and they need to be part of the standard financial system. And PayPal is also a third party who need to verify your transaction. So they are in control of your money if you put your credit into a PayPal account. Whereas Bitcoin, you are in complete control of your wallet and your Bitcoin. You are in complete control of where you're sending it, when you're sending it, and if you want to do anything with it in the first place. Okay, so that is the difference. It came out of the 2008 financial crash. It essentially came from not trusting banks and needing a decentralized exchange so people could have complete control over their digital currency. Now, let's talk about public and private keys because they're very much your bank account and your PIN number, okay? So to own Bitcoin in the blockchain, Bitcoin are registered to a Bitcoin address. So Bitcoin never actually leaves the blockchain. It's always stored on the blockchain. What you actually have is a password or a PIN to access your Bitcoin. But the blockchain is completely secure. Okay, so the way you do is you create a Bitcoin address. Now, you must generate a public and a private key. The private key is like your password or PIN. The public key is like your bank account number for people to send you money. 
okay? But to access your Bitcoin on the blockchain, to send or spend your Bitcoin, you have to be in control of your private key or know your private key. Now, this is a very long-winded number. I'll show it to you in a couple of minutes down the line. And in lesson two, we're going to talk about wallets and how they work. But essentially, you want control of your private key. Now, if you buy Bitcoin on an exchange and you leave it sitting on the exchange, you don't have control of that. So you need to take it offline onto either a software wallet or onto a hardware wallet or paper wallet. And we will talk about how they are used and exactly the steps using it in the next lesson. It's very much like a bank account, but you are in complete control of your bank account as opposed to a third party being in control of it. So think of it like a bank account. You have your PIN number, you have your account number, except you have complete control and responsibility over your digital currency. Now, the disadvantage of being in complete control of your public and private keys is that it can be lost. So there is a story that basically back in 2013, one user claimed to have lost 7,500 Bitcoin, which is about $7.5 million at the time, when he accidentally threw out a hard drive containing his private keys. Okay, so he had no backup for this, he threw out the hard drive, so he no longer had access on the blockchain to his private key, or to his Bitcoin, essentially making that amount of Bitcoin useless, because the blockchain is so secure that it will not give you access unless you have the private key. And that's the disadvantage with a completely decentralized system because you are in complete control and have complete responsibility over your digital currency. Now, Bitcoin was the first digital currency, but it is not the only digital currency now. In fact, there are hundreds. In the top 15 market cap coins, there are Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dash, Monero, and Bitcoin Cash. Now, with new technology came new ideas, and people who believed they could improve on this initial technology when it came to cryptography, blockchain, and digital currency. Now, each of these cryptocurrencies have their own USP, have their own block times, and have their own market cap. So let's go through this now and first of all understand the top cryptocurrencies or digital currencies. And then after this section, we're going to look at platforms, things like Ethereum, things like um, XRP Ripple that are slightly different and are not just a cryptocurrency. But let's start with the cryptocurrencies, the digital currencies. Okay, so first of all, of course, we have Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is limited to 21 million Bitcoin. Okay, so the coding on the blockchain will go up to 21 million and then will never expand beyond that point. Okay, so that means that if Bitcoin is adopted worldwide as a digital currency and you own one Bitcoin, imagine how much one Bitcoin would be worth worldwide if everyone was using it. About 1% of the entire world's population is using cryptocurrency and one Bitcoin currently is worth about 6,000 euro or between six and seven thousand dollars. That's one Bitcoin currently with 1% of the population using it. Now, it is a limited supply. So imagine if the entire world starts using Bitcoin. This is where the potential of investing in it is because if it is adopted worldwide, it has mass potential to hugely increase in value. Okay, The block time is 10 minutes per block. And all that really means is if I send you a transaction within a 10 minute block, it will be confirmed within that 10 minutes. Okay, so if I send it to you in the second minute of a block being created, it might be confirmed by the fifth or sixth minute. But essentially, our transaction is recorded in that block. And then the next block is a new block with a history of all the previous blocks. So all that really tells us is that it will take a max of 10 minutes for our transaction to be confirmed through the blockchain. Okay, now the transaction speed and cost. So Bitcoin would be considered slow when it comes to transaction speed compared to some of the newer cryptocurrencies. 
Okay, now the cost, it was very high a couple of months ago, but new scaling options and technology has come out that have helped bring it down to about 89 cents USD per transaction. And it, it will take a few minutes to confirm, unlike something like Litecoin, which will confirm within about 30 seconds. Okay, now the unique selling point here about Bitcoin is number one, that it was the first digital currency. So it's the big daddy of digital currencies. Number two, it's considered and marketed currently to be digital gold. So the idea of gold being so stable in trading and investing is because it's based on a limited supply that really isn't possible to duplicate or double, right? Well, Bitcoin is the same. Once the 21 million are created, it is not possible to create any more. Okay, the blockchain is incorruptible. It will not expand past 21 million. And that's why it's considered to be digital gold and quite safe to invest in if long term it is adopted. Now, the other big unique selling point Bitcoin has over all other coins and platforms is that the entire market is based against the Bitcoin value. So the majority of centralized exchanges that allow you to buy and sell altcoins like Litecoin, Dash, Monero, Ethereum, Ripple, Dogecoin, you name it, the thousands of altcoins that are out there. You have to buy them with Bitcoin. Now, there is a few exceptions. Litecoin and Ethereum can be bought, and so can Bitcoin Cash on some exchanges. But the majority of centralized exchanges that trade in digital currency, you have to own Bitcoin first to buy the other currencies. You can't buy them a Great British Pound, a Euro, or Yen, or Dollar, or any of that kind of stuff. And that is a huge selling point currently. Now... If that does change in the future, it may bring the value of Bitcoin down quite a lot. We just don't know at the moment. It's still not quite clear if this is going to be adopted worldwide through Bitcoin and Litecoin and Ethereum, or if eventually another cryptocurrency or digital currency comes out that beats all of these previous ones. And I can point back to the internet bubble back in the 2000s, the start of the 2000s, where we had dot-com bubble go up to 11 trillion and drop back down to under 1 trillion, and now it's built back up behind real business proof. But at the moment, it, it really is speculation on what it will do in the future. Okay, But it is considered to be the digital gold. Next up, we have Bitcoin Cash. Now, what is Bitcoin Cash? Bitcoin Cash really is a... F a number of developers that work on Bitcoin that didn't agree with the scaling options of Bitcoin and essentially did a sidetrack off. So they created a new currency off Bitcoin and called it Bitcoin Cash. Now they've limited the same to 21 million, but the blockchain, again, being 10 minutes per block, but they have, at the time, better scaling options to speed up the transactions. However, it's looking like Bitcoin has also solved its transaction speed and cost problems, leaving Bitcoin Cash really to be kind of pointless. Because if people are going to invest in Bitcoin, they'll invest Bitcoin. If they're going to invest in another cryptocurrency, it's probably not going to be Bitcoin Cash. It will be probably something like Litecoin or Monero or Dash. Whereas Bitcoin Cash is kind of in a bit of a limbo at the moment because even though it was considered to be faster than Bitcoin over the past couple over the past year, it's now suffering from Bitcoin solving its scaling options, uh, scaling problems. Okay, so the unique selling point was originally that it was faster and cheaper than Bitcoin with better scaling options, and it's still cheaper. It's still only like three cent per transaction. But the speed really is not much quicker, so leaving in a bit of a limbo in between Bitcoin and altcoins. Okay, next up we have Litecoin. Now, if Bitcoin is digital gold, Litecoin is digital silver. It's been limited to a larger supply, 84 million, invented by a guy called Charlie Lee, who was a developer on Bitcoin, who was a developer on Ethereum, who was a developer on a number of other projects before he created Litecoin. The block time is two and a half minutes per block. So it is four times faster than Bitcoin. 
Its transaction speed is extremely fast. It confirms within about 30 seconds and it only costs about 17 cents per transaction. So about a third of the cost of Bitcoin. And the unique selling point it is that it's digital silver. It's that it has fiat pairings on exchanges. So a lot of altcoins you can't buy with cash or with US dollar or euro or great British pound. You have to buy Bitcoin or Litecoin or Ethereum first and then go and buy your altcoins. You see most of the market is based against the Bitcoin price. But we do have a couple of other currencies that can be bought through normal old money so when it comes to litecoin ethereum bitcoin cash they can also be bought on exchanges for euro or us dollar or great british pound so it gives it that little edge above a lot of other cryptocurrencies that don't have that functionality okay then we have something like dash now dash is limited to 18.9 million so even less than bitcoin and the block time is three to four minutes per block time but the transaction speed was marketed as in seconds so even though the block time is three to four minutes it will confirm in 10 to 15 seconds now although at first it did get a huge amount of hype because of the way the market is at the moment, really, there is no interest in all these altcoins. Most people are looking at Bitcoin, Ethereum, seeing what they do because we had a huge bubble over the past couple of months when it comes to December, January. And now we're really in a bear market for the past two to three months. There's talk about whether it is or isn't leveling out at the moment. So... Really, the buzz around a lot of altcoins is gone until we see what Bitcoin actually does. Does it recover to new highs? Does it stay in accumulation phase at the moment and do nothing? Or does it drop even more? So, Dash was really marketed on being faster and cheaper, but without the buzz in the market, it's not being used. Okay. Now, Monero is very different because Monero is limited to 21.2 million. The block time is two minutes and it confirms very quick within a few seconds. But the unique selling point for Monero here is that it's completely private transactions. Now previously when Bitcoin and all coins started many years ago, most of the transactions were hidden. You couldn't actually see who was giving who their Bitcoin. Okay, And there was a lot of debate that drug cartels and illegal activity and organized crime were using things like Bitcoin and, well, I mean, were using Bitcoin for a long time to launder money. Now, it's actually gotten quite the opposite over the past few months because most of the other cryptocurrencies have gone from being quite private in transactions to being very public because now if you want to buy an exchange or if you want to get um, a secure hardware wallet, you have to confirm your identity in a number of places just like any normal financial institution. So to do that, you're giving away your identity and now all of your transactions can be traced even more than if you walk down the street and use cash. So what Monero does is its unique selling point is it's a completely private transaction. So it will generate new addresses each time it does a transaction. It will not pair you your transactions to your identity. So anyone looking to do private transactions, and it's not necessarily organized crime, it might be business or institutions or just might be for business purposes that you want your transaction to be private, then this is the unique selling point. Now there is a lot of talk of something like Monero or Zcash or any of these privacy coins doing very well over the next couple of years if the market recovers because they have that unique selling point which now the rest of the market doesn't have so guys they are the main cryptocurrencies when it comes to the top 15 market caps okay and there's a huge amount of money in them at the end of the lesson i'll jump on to coinmarketcap.com and i'll show you how big the market cap of these coins are and how much money is involved in investing and trading in them because even though there's only one percent of the world actually using it it's 
you know, the, the current market cap is up around $150 billion worldwide. So it's huge money. And it was close to a trillion dollars at the height of December 2017 uh, before it dropped back down in that bear market for the past few months. Actually, guys, what we'll do is we'll jump straight on to the charts now and have a quick look at what Bitcoin has actually done over the past three months since we had that huge bubble in December 2017 and talk about current market cap. So if we look at the charts here on TradingView, this is the Bitcoin to Euro chart based off, I think it's Coinbase here. So this will be one of the bigger exchanges. And what we can see here is we had a high. Okay, so if I draw a little line here, we had a high in December 2017 of around 7,206 euro or close to twenty thousand dollars okay now since then we had a progressive drop off a sell off which led to a bear market that has lasted since december up until today now what you can actually see today is if i zoom in a little bit we can see that i drew and we'll go through trend lines and technical analysis in the next few lessons but as you can see i drew a, a downward trend line here over the past few weeks which every time we came close to a level it dropped back down so every time we came close to that line we dropped back down showing a downward trend and for the first time we're seeing on the daily chart here this is one day it's peaking up past that trend line so this could signify that we have flattened out in price and we're possibly going to start climbing or maybe steadily accumulate across the way at around 6,224. But as you can see, guys, it has slowly slowed in its downward transition, starting to level out, and we might see some movement on the upside. Okay, same with Ethereum. We look at Ethereum, I could do the same. I could take a line, take from the high price in December all the way down based on all of the other points and again we could have a possible breakthrough with some resistance levels along the way don't worry guys don't worry about if you're not sure how to read charts we're going to go through support resistant trend lines and how to read charts in the next couple of lessons and then guys we have litecoin doing something similar so as you can see the three big major coins that are sold with fiat parents that you can buy with either great british pound with euro they are actually doing quite well now leveling out over the past few days so we did have a bit of a break in litecoin there back in february and then again it continued its downward trend if i take that line from there from here to here and we're back in pretty much a downward trend so we might need to see a bit more movement on that one to break through you could technically draw that line over here as well but we did see a bit of a break of a drastic one all right guys and guys if we go to coin market cap i'm going to show you these resources now in the next couple of lessons and we look at the actual circulating supply and current market cap we are at 129 billion for bitcoin we're at 46 billion for ethereum we're at 22 billion for ripple this is the type of money we're talking about so even though we only have one percent of the population our current overall market cap is up around 299 billion dollars okay so 299 billion dollars in market cap when it comes to the overall cryptocurrency market and bitcoin itself at around 130 billion dollars so absolutely huge amount of money in it remember as i said guys this is all speculation until it's proof of work so even though there's huge amounts of money possibly to be made in it in the long term in the short term trading it is pure speculation and could go to zero any day if it turns out to be invalid or not used in the real world okay now guys just a quick reminder before we do move on that please rate the lesson at the end of the lesson because of course it allows me to improve the content where needed okay to look at lessons to look at the content and where I think it's needed based on your feedback then I can improve those lessons so please do rate the lesson when it appears at the end of the lesson and I very much appreciate every single person's 
feedback so please don't go without rating that lesson and i do appreciate it guys so let's get stuck back in so guys hopefully at this stage you understand a little more the fundamentals between cryptocurrencies or digital currencies now there's another side to blockchain which people think are basically the same as cryptocurrency but is very very different and that is platform based blockchain or blockchain based platform okay now what blockchain based platforms are is they are open source public blockchain based distributed computing platforms and operating systems that feature smart contract and application functionality so that's quite a long-winded and technical definition so what does that mean exactly well a blockchain based platform is an open source computing program and operating system now there is no permission needed to build on the platform there's a smart contract functionality within the platform so if me and you as two businesses want to build a contract on this platform we don't need permission from the platform itself so let's say ethereum or cardano we can build on the platform without their permission so it's like building on the internet you know you build a website in the internet you don't ask the internet for permission so a blockchain based platform is we can build uh, a little application onto the platform onto the blockchain which uses the blockchain technology but in the way we want to use it okay so this can be used in business and finance in crowdfunding and security and verification purposes and it is being used now in centralized exchanges they're using blockchain technology to confirm transactions within a centralized exchange like banks and uh, like a couple of other financial institutions that are testing using blockchain to secure their transactions. Okay. Now, there's a large number of banks and Fortune 500 companies that are currently testing the cases of blockchain platforms for so many other things. Okay. Like another example would be, let's say me and you as two businesses decide to make a deal between me providing a, a product or a service for you to your customers well instead of needing banks and third parties we can build the contract in within the platform and once we both essentially confirm that we have done what we agreed to do within the platform it will pay each other in whatever way we need to be paid or remunerated so again we don't need a bank or a third party we just set the terms on the platform we set to make sure we have to verify it in a certain way and once that's done everything is transferred automatically so it does have the capabilities to really make business and financial transactions and supply chains worldwide a lot more efficient and automated because the more we can automate things like that the less we need third parties involved in certain business and a lot of businesses don't want third parties involved we just have to have them involved to verify certain transactions or requirements within contracts yeah. so like think about if we could build on a platform we might need a solicitor we might need a bank we might need all these things if it's quite a simple contract and essentially all we have to do is complete our terms on the platform and the platform automatically pays us in whatever way we need to be paid okay so that's just one example now what are the blockchain platforms so we have ethereum we have ripple we have stellar newmans we have neo and we have cardano which are all in the top say 20 top 15 they're the main platforms now ethereum was the first ripple is a bit different it's more of a centralized kind of almost going against blockchain technology in one way and the rest of them really aren't proven yet they're just the next step when it comes to blockchain technology and when it comes to third generation cryptocurrencies okay so let's go through really their currencies and what the platforms can be used for so ethereum is the first blockchain platform okay so it does have a cryptocurrency now the cryptocurrency on the ethereum network is ethereum or ether okay so if you build something on the platform you mainly need to use the cryptocurrency ether so therefore if we build something on the platform we do have to use the cryptocurrency and therefore 
um, it gives the cryptocurrency value as well. Okay, it's 14 seconds for block per block. It's incredibly fast. Uh, transaction speed uh, and cost is fast and very low. And as I said, guys, the platform has the Ether or the Ethereum token or cryptocurrency built within it. So whatever we do on the platform, the majority of the time, we have to use the uh, Ethereum token. So we'd have to, if we were doing a smart contract that currently involved normal currencies, we would have to convert those currencies into the Ether currency, have the contract essentially do what it needs to do on the platform. We pay each other in Ether and then we transfer that back into normal currency. Okay, and that's what gives the cryptocurrency its value on the Ethereum platform. But it's not just a digital currency because Ethereum is the platform and Ether is the, the, the currency or token. So that's very, very different to something like Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is solely a digital currency. We can't build anything on Bitcoin. Bitcoin can only be used as a worldwide payment system. Whereas Ethereum, we can use Ether on the Ethereum platform and actually not only use a digital currency, but make our business or financial transactions to supply chains more efficient if we successfully program those contracts or applications on the platform. Now on to Ripple. Okay, now Ripple has its own cryptocurrency, XRP, and it's limited to 1 billion tokens or 1 billion coins. The block time is 3.5 seconds per block. The transaction time or speeds is 1 to 2 seconds to confirm transactions. And the unique selling point here is that Ripple is creating payment protocols for banks and has partnered with a lot of banks and financial institutions over the past year to 18 months. Now, the difference with Ripple compared to really any other cryptocurrency or any other platform is that Ripple is not truly decentralized. It's actually using blockchain in a centralized manner so it can really get the financial sector involved into blockchain and cryptocurrency. Now, the Bitcoin faithfuls have an issue with this and they criticize Ripple for not being truly decentralized and moving away from the reason why cryptocurrency and blockchain came out in the first place. And that was that we didn't have trust in the financial sector any longer and we wanted to create a decentralized environment, decentralized system where we wouldn't have to trust the financial sector or a third party. Whereas Ripple are saying, look, if we don't get the financial sector, if we don't get the current system involved in cryptocurrency, involved in blockchain, then it will never take off. So you have two sides to this. Some people absolutely love Ripple, how much they've actually managed to get it implemented and adopted by financial institutions. And then you have the true Bitcoin evangelists who talk about Ripple like it's the devil. Okay, I don't think it's either. I think it's just a different pathway in what we're doing. Now, the other difference is with Ripple, you don't have to use the XRP currency on the platform. So when banks are using the payment protocol through Ripple, they don't actually have to use XRP. They can use Great British Pound. They can use dollar, yen, euro, whatever they want to use, which means that the valuation to Ripple is not connected to the currency, but actually connected to the company Ripple itself. And this is where we have to be very clear about what are we actually investing in? Are we investing in the company or are we investing in the cryptocurrency? Because if you don't have to use XRP on the Ripple service, the Ripple payment system, then why would the currency ever be valued in any way if it's never used. So what do we want to invest in? The platform or the cryptocurrency? Okay, now Stellar Newman's is an interesting one as well because again, the max supply is quite similar. Block time is quite similar. And the payment protocol for banks, the actual USP, what they're trying to do is almost identical to Ripple. The difference here is when you use the Ripple platform, you don't have to use their cryptocurrency XRP. However, when you use Stellar Newman's, you have to use the cryptocurrency XLM or you can't use the platform. So they're also trying to provide payment protocols for banks and a lot of smaller institutions that Ripple won't deal with at the moment 
to confirm transactions. However, you have to use the cryptocurrency XLM. So if you imagine that half the banks in the world start using Stellar Newman and half the banks in the world start using Ripple. When they start using Ripple, it doesn't necessarily increase the cryptocurrency's value in Ripple, which is XRP, because they don't have to use that currency. However, the other half of the world using Stellar Lumens, think about this. You've invested into XLM, the cryptocurrency, not the platform, but the cryptocurrency. And now half the banks in the world are using that platform and have to use XLM. So now your cryptocurrency that you've invested in is probably four, five, six, ten, twenty 10, 20 times more valuable than it was when you invested. Now with the Ripple example, you'd have to invest in the company or the platform and not necessarily the cryptocurrency. And this is where the gray area is with these platforms and cryptocurrencies and the cryptocurrencies attached to the platforms and people not understanding that they're not one and the same. Very, very simply, when you're, when you're investing in a digital currency that's just a digital currency, there's no gray area. If lots of people start using it, it will increase in value. If no one uses it, it will fall in value. Whereas with platforms, it's a bit different. The platform has to be adopted, and then we have to know if we're investing in the cryptocurrency of that platform, is the, platform being, or is the cryptocurrency being used as well. So I know it seems a little bit confusing, but hopefully that clears that up for you a little bit, guys. Hopefully that clears that up for you a little bit. Okay, so that's the main blockchain platforms when it comes to the top 15, top 20 market caps, Ethereum, Ripple, Stellar, NEO and Cardano. And again, NEO and Cardano, they're very much projects that sound great and the theory behind them is amazing, kind of third generation cryptocurrencies and, and, and uh, blockchain platforms, but they haven't really have any proof of work yet. Like we don't really see any proof of them being used with partners, with applications. They're really only at testing stages and development stages. So although there's a lot of hype behind it, it's very much speculation. And to be honest, guys, with all of this, when it comes to digital currencies, when it comes to blockchain platforms, when it comes to cryptocurrencies attached to blockchain platforms, it's still mainly all speculation. We don't know that this is actually going to be adopted long term currently. The potential is amazing. The potential is it could change the financial sector and business the way the internet did 20 years ago. Okay, It's literally the internet of money. This could completely change the way we do business and use money. However, it could just completely fall on its face in a year's time when a newer technology or a better idea comes out similar to what blockchain is doing. So although the potential is huge, you have to understand, and I really do want to nail this in for everyone on the first lesson before we talk about investing and trading cryptocurrency, that at the moment, 90% of the investing and trading in cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology is pure speculation. It is speculation of what it could do and not what it is doing. Okay, so understand that before we move on, guys. Now, to finish up today's lesson, I want to go through a few specific terms when it comes to the cryptocurrency space that you'll start to come across as you get more involved in investing and trading in this strange little financial sector if you do indeed actually put any of your money into it okay the first is all coins you'll hear all coins talked about a lot bitcoin and all coins essentially all coins are everything but bitcoin or ethereum and true i suppose true cryptocurrency believers talk about really bitcoin and then everything else is an altcoin so if you're not talking a bit about bitcoin if you're talking about dash or ethereum or monero or ripple or zcash or any of these other altcoins they're altcoins alternative coins to bitcoin okay so that's what we're talking about and when you hear me say altcoins for the next four weeks for the next 10 weeks we're talking about anything but bitcoin okay now when we talk about fiat currency we're thinking about old money old money and new money right so government issue currency such as the us dollar the euro the japanese yen the great british pound any worldwide currency you can think of the um uh, saudi arabian real south african 
the South African Rand, you name it, any money that we use worldwide, whether it be in cash form or in digital form, that's you know connected to a centralized exchange in a government, that's what we talk about, fiat. Fiat currency is, just think of it as old money, and cryptocurrency is new money, it's digital assets, okay, digital assets. Now guys, the next term you will need to know is HODL, and it means investing long term. So you have to remember that this community, this cryptocurrency space came out of developers and programmers, and it really was the biggest transfer of wealth we have seen in history over the past 10 years. And we've seen a lot of this meme culture and community come out within this space, and one of them is HODL. HODL means investing in long term, holding your Bitcoin, holding your altcoins, because no matter what the market's doing, it's going up. Now, that's not great investment advice. That's not necessarily great trading advice, but it's something you will hear in the space. And basically, someone on a Reddit forum accidentally misspelled hold for HODL when the market was going down, and it became the theme for the next, essentially, couple of years for when the market is in a bad place, just hold on to your coins, okay? And then lastly, guys, mooning. You will hear this. It does not mean to expose your buttocks in the cryptocurrency space. It means that a particular cryptocurrency or a particular platform is drastically improving uh, in price to astronomical levels. And we've seen that, especially over the past six months or so. So guys, I'm going to wrap up lesson one there. But congratulations on completing lesson one. And I hope you're looking forward to seeing your trading improve on every